So uh, DDA Demolin is presenting on a musical voyage in Kenyan traditional music. Okay, first of all, thank you Andrew, Richard and uh, Martin for inviting me. So when Martin invited me to give, uh, to participate to this workshop, uh, he said to me, you should talk about music. Uh, and uh, that made me come uh, back 30 years ago, so I'm sorry, but uh, I haven't been in the area uh, very, very recently. But I'm going to talk about traditional music of Kenya, and the reason why I'm going to talk about that is that because I think there's a lot of discussion these days about uh, endangered languages, but nobody talks about endangered traditional music, and I think it's even probably more a threat than uh, the languages and probably one of the main forces against uh, traditional music is uh, what we call world music that is virtually destroying all areas of traditional music. But we can talk about that later. So I'm going to talk about Luo, uh, Gusi and Kuria music and I will say a little word about uh, music from the East uh, later on. So one of the main instruments that you find um, in this area is uh, the lyre that's called Nyatiti or Tum, it depends of the places and the people that you meet. But that's a very interesting instrument that uh, I think that goes far beyond uh, folkloric music or just traditional music, there's real scholar music behind it. And some of the points that I want to, to emphasize, I don't want to go into formal analysis of traditional music because I think musicologists can be as boring or maybe even more boring than linguists when they start to discuss <laughs> about formal things. But I think that, just as a reminder, uh, Hugh Tracy, who made one of the best survey ever of traditional music of Africa, went to work uh, among the Luo and the Kipsigis uh, in the 1950s, and the work is extremely valuable. So I've been able to compare 30 years after what he has done, and very recently some people showed me things that shows that there is a continuity in this tradition of music that remains quite stable in this culture. So one of the formal things that's extremely interesting to study is uh, scales. Uh, scales, you find pentatonic scales of various kinds of this area, and you also find tetratonic scales. Uh, I will show you examples of that uh, in a few seconds. But that is extremely interesting because scales define cultural areas in terms of music. And a scale is a bit like a kind of phonological system for music, if you want. And that is a very important thing to study. And uh, you find almost no reference to that. It's a bit like if you study, describe a language, and you say, well, let's, let's leave phonology aside. That's not that important. Phonologists and phoneticians are annoying people, so we just stay with the syntax. It's a bit like the same kind of thing for music. So pentatonic scales are often made of the combination of two tetratonic scales. And I will show you that that's why the, the nyatiti is extremely interesting to look at for that. So the question is cultural areas, um, contact changes. Uh, music, traditional music, is a very, very stable thing. So if you have uh, novelties, what happens is usually it's superimposed on, 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 a, on a traditional basis. And even in contact areas, the traditional basis remain quite stable, and you have additions, but that's one of the interesting features about music. So, for example, uh, I didn't want to, to put all musical scales in a sophisticated way. I just write, wrote the notes uh, or, or, or above. The first line always shows the left hand of the musician, and the second line, the right hand, and the underlying thing, the scale. Okay? So you have a pentatonic scale here, and uh, the musicians, they usually play, uh, they have left and right hand, and the left and the right hand, the, the, this music, this instrument, sorry, have eight strings, four for the left hand and four the, for the right hand. And there is always one note in common between the two hands. So you have the F sharp above and the F sharp uh, below. These are shared, and these are two different strings that are uh, tuned exactly in the same way. That makes the difference between the two. So that's why you have two superimposed tetratonic scales, and that's what makes a, a, a pentatonic scale. So in terms of the evolution of musical system, it's very interesting because tetratonic is supposed to be 
older than pentatonic scales in the story of music, but by combining two tetonic scales, you can make a pentatonic scale. So that's a possible explanation for the, the emergence of pentatonism in this part of Africa. I don't have any definitive answer for that. So if you just want to listen, I've put very a few examples of just w about one minute. So, okay, should come. Just one musician. <laughs> So, sorry to talk about the same time, but you will have other examples. Musicians play the rattles with their ankles, the, the percussion with the, the, the uh, foot tongue here. So everything is done by, the, by one person. He sings, he plays, and he makes the percussion at the same time. Okay? So that's... Uh, and the way they play, you have, you see, you can listen that what he's doing in terms of melody, it's a kind of what we call an ostinato. It's a melody, melodical rhythmic structure that repeats itself over and over and over, and the song is developed on top of that. So this is very typical of this tradition, this kind of music. You have um, uh, instrumental in, uh, intermediates, if you want, and while the guy is singing, he's usually basing himself on an ostinato. An ostinato is just this kind of melody rhythmic structure that changes over the time. You have more sophisticated musicians. Here is one, it's just to show you another type of scale that we've been finding. Again, you have a pentatonic scale of a kind. So they're slightly different from one, one from the other, but they are almost the same. And that is also something that we have to explain uh, that has been almost not studied at all in the, the story of this music. So studying traditional music, we should start by the beginning, understanding the scales, understanding how they were made, and how are they basing themselves, and why are they used in some cases and why not in other cases. So you have here one of the, it was in my opinion, one of the best Lua musicians that I met in the area of uh, Kisumu uh, in Kenya, Lucas Wamiya, who has uh, a very interesting uh, musical style instrumentally and usually is accompanied by other singers. And there is this kind of vocal style that you find that we've been talking with Richard and uh, Andrew earlier on, this kind of throat singing that's accompanying the, the, the music. Maybe there's a little part of that thing. So I'm going to give you one minute and I will shut up when, I, when he's playing now. Um, so that should work now. <laughs> So maybe if you pay attention, there is this bass line that's played by, <coughs> by some of the musicians here. So there is, the, there is a whole bass line that is developed by a kind of throat noise that's made by one of the, the person that's accompanying the musician. And it's only one person who does that. So probably since I'm going to give the, the recordings to, to Richard and uh, Andrew, you probably retrieve that uh, later on. Just by the way, this little opening here is the musician put all this per percussion stuff inside the, the, the box when he, when he stops playing. Uh, so that's just some people answer. 
The last example from Luo is one very famous musician among the Luo in the area of um, Kisumu to Dawidi Owiti, who was a blind musician, who had a very interesting uh, musical style. His, his instrument was a bit larger than the other one, so the tune was a little bit lower. And uh, he had a way to, to, to organize the, the, the strings that made them the sound very uh, much softer. That so you can work on the timbre instrument. So any kind of, uh, any musician in the, uh, the Luo area, you don't have to show the photo. You give the tuning of one instrument to, to some Luo people and they will tell you, this is Davidi Owiti, this is Lucas Wamiya. Because the timbre of the instrument is really uh, one of the interesting features. And that is something that it's also virtually not explored at all. The timbre of instruments. If you play a violin in Europe, even if you play a Stradivarius, most people will just say it's a violin. I'm sorry, but most people will not make the difference between a Stradivarius and another instrument. But among I in traditional music of Africa, for, m for Likembe, Mbira, uh, lyre and other instruments, local people will immediately tell you that is this guy because there is a kind of you know color or flavor of the way he's tuning his instrument that makes it immediately recognizable, and that's also something that has been not studied at all. So just one minute of look at that with the witty, and then we move to something else. <laughs> Someone is not happy with the music. So a, sorry to, to speak now, but there is a huge repertory of this music uh, in East Africa, and if you want to hear that, it's not accessible uh, to, to, to outsiders. I mean, local people, of course, they, they have access to their own music. But I think it's not diffused at all. And I think it's a shame because I think it's very important. It's uh, extremely interesting music. And most outsiders, when they consider this kind of music, they consider it as a kind of folklore. And I think that there are indeed less things of the kind of folkloric music, but there are okay, also kind of a scholar tradition in the noble sense of the term. And most people cannot make the difference between the two, the two kind of things. And so this is because it's not studied and we still have a lot to do on, on that. So another thing of um, instrument that's very common in the area, that's a one string fiddle. Uh, and so I've worked for some time with this guy that was called Charlie Ormondi. And Charlie Ormondi said to me, I'm playing traditional music, but I want to do that in a modern way. So he had made a small band and he was playing in bars and uh, to, 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 to attend some feast. So you have tuned drums, uh, one string fiddle, and then you have rattles and, and kind of things accompanying him. It's just feast music. So here it is. And that is also one of the interesting of traditional music. You can evolve in modern things with traditional instruments. You're not st stuck on tradition.
So this is one of the interesting features of, of when you meet young guys. There are two kinds of behavior that I have been seeing in mainly in Congo and the, the former Zaire. Young people are ashamed of their traditional music because I think they have made, made, made ashamed of their own tradition. Or young guys who say, well, we can do modern music with traditional instruments. And that has been all over the time the same kind of things. I mean, traditional to music is not stuck at one time. It just changed in time. And these guys are making the, the, their own tradition evo evolve or change or adapt to, to, to a number of things. And I think this is very interesting. A lot of ethnomusicologists don't want to study that because it looks too modern. But I think it's very interesting to look at. And it's always the kind of relation that you have of what's traditional, what's not traditional. And that makes that we have a, a few things to be fix to fix. So the other group that I've been studying at that time were Kuria people. And Kuria people, very surprisingly, is a small group. You all know that probably uh, better than me. But they have an incredibly diverse instrumentarium. That's where I found the, the most diverse uh, uh, use of musical instruments. So they have also this kind of one uh, string fiddles. You have these huge rattles that is very, very common among, uh, among the Kuria. And here the guy also plays the percussion uh, with his feet. You have this stick that's passed between two uh, finger tools, and you have the, the, the rattles that here, and just by slamming that on this piece of wood that he makes the percussion. So here is one example of that. I think it's better to hear music than me. One interesting, if you look at that a little bit more formally, you have the beat is given uh, by this uh, by this percussion instrument. So you have a, a music that is um, not based in the same way as Western music is, is done by, you know, you have bars with strong and weak times. So here you have just a music that's defined by cycle of time and that's defined by a number of beats in the time. So usually it's 8 to 12 or something like that. And so the beat is, must be absolutely regular, and that's why the musician is playing that himself. He doesn't want anybody else to play that uh, instead of him at, at that time. And the whole construction of rhythmic construction is based on this pulsation, that it must be extremely rigid. And then you can do a, a lot of things. But it's a, very com it's a very different way of looking at music. The rhythmic patterns are not built at all in the same way of, as, uh, as Western music. And so when you want to transcribe this music, people usually say, well, these traditional music, the musicians, they're not very well tuned, or they're slightly, well, first of all, not very well tuned. It's non -temp not, not well tempered music, first of all. So this is not the same kind of uh, reference that we have in Western music. The second point is that if you have this different rhythmic organization, it means that if you make the transcribe the music in bars, there's always one bar where the guy will change the, 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 the cycle very slightly in time, and you will always fall apart the, the, the place where you should be in, in terms of rhythm. But it's absolutely normal for them. But for someone who's strictly fixing on bars, it's, it's just out of, out of tune, of out of rhythm. And so this is a completely different reference system that we have to explicit and, uh, and make 
uh, on a piece of paper when you transcribe this music, and there's a lot to be done on that. There had things have been done on that, but that's that's not obvious for, for a lot of people. So we still hear, well, traditional musicians, uh, okay, they're funny, but they're not very well in tune, they're not very well in rhythm. That's not true at, at all. These music are extremely sophisticated, extremely well built. The architectural structure of this music is extremely organized. So there's not there's I'm exag exaggerating now. There is virtually no place for improvisation. That that's not the way, the exact way. But I just want to enforce that, to say that it is extremely rigid and well organized music. So someone who thinks that these guys are playing loose music, you're completely uh, wrong if if you think that. So uh, another example of this guy playing the the, the one string fiddle. But I just wanted to emphasize the role of these huge rattles uh, played by uh, this Korea woman. It's permanent in all this music. So I'm going to give you one example of that. You will have the guy who plays the one string fiddle at the beginning, and you will gradually see the appearance of these huge rattles that give, the, the in that case, the, uh, the rhythmic structure. And uh, I think this is also an interesting stuff, because in this collective music, you have music that looks like music of some of their neighbors, if you see what I mean. Uh, by, I mean, most of you know better the area than me, but there's a lot of influence that's coming from, from outside. And Korea people, a very small group of people, who have integrated a lot of tradition from their, their neighbors. So that is interesting to, to look at. And by the way, the, the one string fiddler, when they came, the first time that I worked with him, it's just an anecdote in passing. I still have a bit of time. He was with the one string fiddle playing the theme of the ninth Beethoven Ninth Symphony. He said, Do you know that stuff? I heard that on the radio. So he was perfectly able to play the theme of the Ninth Symphony uh, on, on this one string fiddle. So it shows you that these guys have both ears and capacity in terms of techniques. So here it is. Well, you have that before, before the mouth would then. Uh, so you have. The initiation is done by the one string fiddle, and it's a uh, collective music of fees. I said a little, I said very few things about the collective setting, but I'm gonna say a word at the end about that. So it's just the kind of prelude that's done by the string, and here it is. Well, at the time that the rattles come in, if you just put your hand like that, you will see that at the beginning of, of each initiation of the, the one string fiddle, you ride on, on time. So, I mean, the, and it is aligning himself on the rattles and not the contrary. So, that is very interesting to, to look at. M mouth bow. This is the mouth bow of the Kuria. Uh, that is, I've never seen. Mouth bow is very common in Africa. But I've never seen that one. Again, the guy is playing the rhythm, the rhythm uh, uh, by himself. He has a small rattle in hand now. He's uh, hitting the string with his hand where he has the rattle. And the bow is put against the harp palate inside his mouth. So I've never seen that before. So the, the courier people is very common among them. But it's one way to play the, the mouth bow. So it gives you this. Sorry, I didn't know what. It's 
these are, these are music uh, for uh, divert, I mean, to make, to make enjoying yourself or to seduce the young girls. I mean, these are two, two, uh, this is one of the functions of this mouse ball. The interesting thing with this mouse ball is that if you ask people, do we have uh, pitch variation, people say, of course, we hear pitch variation, there's none. In fact, you have timber variation. What the guy is doing is moving the shape of his cheeks when he's playing, but there is just one string that is hitting, that is all. So if you have one string, you have one pitch, that's all. So th the impression that you have of pitch variation, is fa in fact, is timber variation. And again, we are looking at timber rather than at uh, changes in pitch. And that is one very important aspect of traditional music of Africa. I mean, timber has a crucial role in, 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 uh, in music in Africa. Uh, it's true for us too, eh? but uh, it's manipulated in different ways. And that is one very important feature of tr African traditional music. So one other instrument that you find uh, with the kuria that's linked with uh, circumcision songs uh, is the mouth bow. <laughs> It was the courier chief, that's why he's so well dressed, he wanted to be nice for them. Again, you can hear that when you have instrumental variation, he stops singing. Uh, so that is very common in the music. And if you have the uh, song phrases, it's usually a few syllables based on, uh, on three rhythmical structures. So everything is planned, organized, and framed uh, in these things too. So this is another thing of the kuria. Um, sorry. Uh, so here is one instrument that we found among the, the Luo. Um, where the, in the, among the kuria, it's called iritungu. Uh, the name of the instrument is played in the same way. But they have a very, uh, I mean, they had very, very strange tuning for me. And eventually, after long, you know, transcription studies, I think they are playing on tetrachords, not on pentatonic scale in that case. I will give you that to hear in a second. So the lyre is used in two contexts for historical songs, clan songs, praise songs, or to accompany a huge dance that's that I'm going to show you at the end, a huge feast dance, when senior people are becoming real seniors, when they, they're allowed to marry for the third or the fourth time, there's a huge feast, and I will show you that, what, what, how it happens in a second, and the instrument is playing in that circumstance. So this is, the photo was made at that time, and the second one is the same musician who was uh, singing the story of his clan at that time, and uh, if you look at the tuning that he has here, we have something that is, we have F, F sharp, A sharp, and C. And F and F sharp might be, I mean, I was not 100% sure that it was really F sharp, okay? So it's, it's not uh, well-tempered tuning. So you slightly uh, uh, lower than a F sharp, so is it F or F sharp? It was higher than the other one, so I decided it was F sharp, but I might be wrong by doing that. So, but in any case, you, can, you have a kind of tetratonic scale in that case. And so this is one of these very old uh, bases of traditional music of Africa. And that's absolutely fascinating because it's not simpler music. Eh? That's not because you are in tetratonic scales that you are playing something more primitive or something more simple. It's a different way of playing music, and that is all. So here it is. Uh, it's a very interesting musical example. <laughs> I'm not a 
This is completely different from Luo music. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another musical world. And some people who know blues quite well say, well, sometimes we have this kind of uh, things that uh, blues flavor coming out from that. It's just the flavor. I mean, uh, I don't want to make a, a link between the two things. But it is very interesting to hear because you, you, you are two neighboring cultures and you have, you know, different ways of different pa musical patterns using the same instruments using slightly different scales, and you have, uh, I mean, wha wha what we just heard. So there is another instrument, but I'm not going to give you that to hear, that probably some of you know also from the, the, the lake area. This is uh, a sitter. Uh, in Rwanda, Angola, you have this uh, uh, sitter that is on a, on, a, on a large piece of wood. This one has a resonator. It is exactly the same principle as the Inanga that you find in, in Rwanda. The other thing that uh, we're still among the Korea. Korea is incredible for the instrumental diversity. This traverse flute, uh, they have a an incredible repertory of that too. Uh, this is one musician, here is a second musician. One is right handed and the other one is left handed, as you can see. Uh, and I'm going to give you that one, which is a very particular guy uh, who is also playing everything at the same time. He's singing. Uh, playing the flute, not at the same time, of course. And he's playing the percussion himself. Uh, so he has around uh, the, the lower part of his legs is a cans full of uh, stones and screws and things like that. So I think it's the physical performance of this guy is absolutely incredible. But that's, uh, sometimes he plays alone, and sometimes he plays in large musical feats, because it really sounds quite strongly. So I just wanted to, you to give that to hear. Um, and this is part of a uh, um Okay, so the performance of that guy was 20 minutes. I tried to put that around my legs and I could stay two minutes with that and trying no, no more than that. I mean, it's just, just absolutely incredible. But look at the musical scale here. You have a pentatonic scale in that case, a nice, beautiful pentatonic scale. Uh, so, I mean, we're not in string instruments anymore. So we just on one sing simple instrument. So there is there are there are a lot of things to understand of that. Why do we have pentatonic scale with wind instruments? All the wind instruments that I've been studying, but one have pentatonic scales, and the string instruments you have this pentatonic scale, tetratonic scale, or combination of two tetratonic scales that making a pentatonic scale. So there's a lot of things to 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 understand on the way this musical universe is structured. So the other thing 
I mean, there's probably a couple of other examples from Korea. Here is an interesting little example that we can call either a whistle or an ocarina that's played by uh, one woman here. And it's used, usually used to, um, to make uh, children sleep. The interesting thing is that she's making an almost a yodel between the, the, the change between the whistle and her voice. You can uh, you have a reduced change. Uh, When I mentioned that to her, that she was, you know, when you make a yodel, you go from chest voice to head voice. And so the chest voice would have been here, the whistle, and the head voice, the voice of the woman. And so she was alternating between the two things. And when I mentioned that to her, she said to me, yeah, I took that from the Gogo people, because she had been in contact with some Gogo guys. And this, it was apparently an innovation done by her. Other people mentioned to, that to me. So you should go and see that woman. She's doing something very interesting with that instrument. And this almost yodeling style is, that what is something that you find uh, in vocal polyphonies that you might found among, among the Gogo, who are living much more uh, so, in the south of, of, of this area. But that's an interesting, uh, again, an interesting thing is that if you put people like that, I mean, traditionally are not stuck. Usually you have someone marrying uh, someone other that brings part of a musical tradition, and that's what happened in that area. That was uh, the way the contact was made. And so some innovation can propagate in that way. But again, we don't know almost nothing about that. So the last example from Korea is the following. So you have this huge dance that's done when a man becomes a senior. Uh, so you have women, men singing together. They're accompanied by various kinds of musical instruments, uh, lyre, flute, rattles, and almost everything. And you have the men are dancing on, how do you call that thing that you have in Holland, in wood? I forgot that, sabot in French. Clomp. Clomp, OK. I mean, most du people are here are, are Dutch, so clump uh, in, with, with, you know, stones inside, inside, and that makes that the men are much taller than women here. They're almost, they're already taller, but they are much taller here, and they are, I mean, they are cheating, of course, uh, in, the, in their size in that case. But men and women are dancing together and making kind of uh, eight circles uh, while they are dancing that has a lot of symbolism uh, among the, the Kuria, the, the, the eight circle uh, design, some figures in the tradition, but I'm, well, I won't go there in that uh, unless you want me to talk about that later. But I'm just going to give that to you here. Uh, here is an, that's on the return of the, the circle. Here it is. What's interesting here, 
they are Bantu people. There's nothing to do with uh, Bantu music. I mean, you find no Bantu music uh, uh, of this time. I mean, it has clearly been influenced by, by various other things. The dancing style is more like nilotic people, you know, moving upwards on, on their, their tiptoes. Uh, women raising their hands in this way. I mean, this, is, this has nothing to do with Bantu, but it's Bantu music. So the Kuria have integrated a lot of things from uh, the, the, their neighbors, and that makes the Kuria music particularly interesting to study. So the last example of this area, it's an, an incredible music instrument, as you can see. There's a huge bass lyre that's called Obokano. I forgot to write it. That's called Obokano. That's music played at two times of the year, during harvest feast or during uh, some uh, clan uh, singing for the clan history uh, that at a particular time of the year. But that instrument, as you can see, is particularly big. And I will show you probably it's still going to be visible on, on the other photo here. So you have the tuning of the instrument here. The instrument is, if you put it, it's probably as tall as I am. Uh, this is, it's a huge instrument. Um, you have here, below the strings here, you have reeds. You have that on the Nyatiti and the Tom too. But it's much smaller, so the buzzing sound is lighter. In that case, here, here you will hear that it's a very strong buzzing sound. The only instrument that I know that has such an important buzzing sound is the Bagana lyre that you find in Ethiopia, much further in the north. So I don't say that there is a link between the two things. Uh, but I think this lyre tradition, they go from, from Ethiopia down to this part of Africa. They go in the, uh, uh, all uh, along the Nilotic people. So the, tr the history of the instrument is also very interesting to do. And so recently we've started a study with some people at the Musée de l'Homme in Paris to compare the name of all these instruments wherever we can find them. And we also find interesting clustering and patterning. So that is, and we, and Aligned with the names, you also find specific scaling systems when we have them. So that's even more interesting. But there's, again, I'm repeating myself, there's a lot to, a lot to be done. So if you want to know how these instruments are tuned, here the musician just moves the string. And so you see there's a kind of uh, net of uh, crossing of the string. But it's strong enough that just by moving in that way, you can uh, strengthen or lighten the, the, the tension of the string. So that's how, it, that's how it's tuned. So here is an example of that instrument. Uh, wait, sorry. That was during a, a harvest feast. But th there's a lot of uh, variation in what he's playing. Um, well, this concludes this part on music instruments of Luo, Gusi, and Kuria. But I have, as, as you've seen, I just showed you instrumental music traditions. I haven't shown anything about vocal styles. And there's still 
one mystery to be solved is the what can we say about musical scales when you sing and what's, uh, what the musical scale where they play. But people say, well, that should be the same. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. And it's more difficult to study musical scales by ear. So you have a lot of, trans uh, there's a lot of uh, transcription work to be done in, in that case. And when you have several people singing together, it's difficult to have the, the, the exact patterning of one person, so you have to find re-recording techniques and transcribing one voice after the other. And so it takes time and uh, things to be done. Just to finish and to reassure about the value of tradition, here's one example uh, coming from the East. It's just to finish on, on a different note. So that's a musician that I've been recording in 1984 in Lamu in Kenya. Uh, that's, that's interesting about contact and tradition. The texts are sung in Swahili. Uh, these are Tarabu. Uh, Jan Knappart has done uh, a huge work on publication on Tarabu texts and songs. Uh, if anybody is interested to study that, I have the whole repertory of uh, Mohamed Famau that waits to be studied. Uh, I always thought that I would do it, and I will probably never do it. Uh, so anybody who wants to have that, I will give you gladly the material to study. I mean, it's written in Swahili, translated, but there's, you know, kind of study to be done, to, to be done on, on that stuff. So the instrument is here. You have an harmonium here. You have bongo and you have tabla. So the interesting thing is that you have song in Swahili. You have all the instruments are not from African origin. These instruments come here from India and Pakistan. It's used in the, uh, in the Kawali music. That's the sacred music that you have in Pakistan and India. The instrument came along the east coast of Africa during the monsoon time where you had the sailors coming from India uh, to exchange things and they were going back and forth from that part of the world to India. Tabla is, of course, not, uh, not African too. It's an Indian percussion instrument, and this is even played let, let's leave it for Africa. Some people want that to be South American, but I don't think it is. I think it's, it's in origin in, in Africa. But the interesting thing here, you have the combination of various things. So Indians who listen to that the first time, they will say, that's bad, popular Indian music. And they say, well, in fact, it's not bad, but it sounds different. I mean, in which language are they singing? So we say, that's African. They say, OK, that's OK. We don't understand nothing about that. So that's OK for them. So, but the interesting thing here, you have a whole tradition of music that came without the influence of world music, and it had time to intertwine and develop and gave something very, very interesting. So that's the last thing that I'm going to give you to hear. Here it is, one minute of Mohammed from our group. So this is the instrument that you have here. Taepuka Kwa madila Unayoni You're not happy about us above, I think. Masumbuko ni mechoka Namileo Taepuka Kwa komwana So the percussion starts here and then you have the other. Just one very sample of Tahabu, Tahabu music. It was very interesting and very nice music, of course. So that was what I wanted to show you. It was just a musical flavor of this part of Africa, just to answer to the nice invitation that I had. Uh, 
I hope that I didn't took too much of your ears because I could could have done formal tradition and things, but I don't want to, to annoy people with uh, formal analysis. You have enough with syntax and linguists uh, <laughs> about that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So we'll move to the next room. Does anyone have a question or comment? Mm. Yes, please. This is fascinating. I, I don't know much about music, but I was just thinking that when you Think about transcription for scales. Is there objective criteria or it's really from the perception? Well, I think that if you transcribe music, you can, try, can transcribe any kind of music on a piece of paper using uh, you know, a, a kind of G, G, G reference for the Western music. That's, that's, that's just putting a pitch on a piece of paper. So the objective criterion is what the note that you are hearing. You can listen to Indian music, to Chinese music, to African music. You put that on a piece of paper. The problem that we have when transcribing, if I understand well your question, is that what kind of res reference sy system do we have? The reference system, in fact, um, if I'm a Westerner, I have difficulties to transcribe Indian traditional music on a piece of paper because you have some kind of musical intervals that I'm not used to. to even if I, if I can discriminate them, I'm not able to identify them correctly. So the only thing that you can do, and, putting, uh, and the only reason why we transcribe things, is that we want to understand the structure of the music. And I think that's a way to look at music transcription. We don't want to transcribe something that we will have, that we will repeat by, you know, by putting a music score in front of someone and say, now you're going to play this, as we do in, in, in written musical traditions. What we want to do when you transcribe something is understanding how music is structured. And if you transcribe that, there is an approximation, but this approximation is tolerable. But th the music pattern will not change if you transcribe a sharp uh, for a not sharp or something like that. And that is the goal of transcription, is to try to understand the structure of the music or the, artic the architecture of the musical system. So in a way, if we compare to linguistics, it's almost like phonemic transcription. Or narrow phon this is narrow yeah, phonetic transcription phonetic. against phonemic, yeah. So what we, what we do is phonemic transcription. We try to do phonemic transcription. There are only devils like Bela Bartok who was able to transcribe minute details of, of musical things that, I mean, if you look at Bartok transcription, that's why I became an ethnomusicologist, because of Bartok. Years after, I went to his musical transcription of Hungarian and Romanian music. Sometimes I feel deaf when I hear what he has done because this guy was really able to transcribe minute details. And by you know, repeating the things, you say, OK, I got it now, why, why not? But the thing is that I was transcribing that to preserve the music. He had another musical transcription saying, I'm transcribing um, a kind of phonemic transcription of the thing because he wanted to reuse that to play in, in, in other things. So that is yeah, it's a good comparison. I will use it in the future. Narrow phonemic against pho uh, narrow phonetic against phonemic. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll take one more question. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. You said that African music was rich and well organized. Yeah. And I was wondering if. Uh, musicians were aware of this rule, they were conscious, like conscious of it. They, they knew they were able to list those rules, for example, or they can just hear what is wrong, but they can't really explain why it, why it would be wrong. I can answer for Congolese music, not for Kenyan music, because mm -hmm. I didn't make the questions with these guys, but I'm pretty sure that the answers are almost the same. If you go among the Congolese musicians, um, it is non-verbal uh, theoretical, theoretical uh, systems, non-verbalized. So it means that they don't have a word for scale, they don't have a word for note and things like that. But they are completely aware of these things. And one very good example of that, if you study vocal uh, polyphonies of the pygmies, which is, by the way, one of the most sophisticated things that mankind has ever produced. If you say that pygmies and Bach 
uh, the same sophistication in terms of polyphonic structure of people will say, this can't be these savages, I can't be comparable to that. They are. And if you look at that, you go among the pygmies and they have no word for counterpoint and these things, but they do that. But if you alter that by discussing with them, for example, I was talking about the stiffness of the pulse. Westerners usually, when they participate to musical feast uh, in Africa, they try to take a rattle or something like that. Try to do that and just move a little bit. People will take the rattle back from you and say, you're very kind, but just sing or do something else because <laughs> you're just moving the structure. I mean, they align themselves on that thing. So pygmies will tell you that. Among the pygmies they had, we found eventually uh, with Simha home in France after 20 years, one day we were, you know, if you have vocal polyphonies, there is a, a reference, a melodic reference line uh, that's called the cantus firmus in Western music. And uh, one day we were, you know, we had four lines and apparently they were referring to something. And one of the guys uh, with whom we were working said, well, what is the reference that you are that you are looking at? It's not this, not this, not this. And the guy was said, "Well, that's the mother of the song." So the mother of the song was their cantus firmus, and they had the word "mother of the song." But it, you have to raise the correct question. So since then, musicologists, it was done long time ago. We have learned to try to explicit non-verbalized knowledge. And that is the whole thing about traditional music in Africa. There's a lot of things to be done, but I think these guys, they have a complete representation, they have a complete uh, consciousness of their thing. But how do we make that explicit? If you don't have terms for abstract terms for these things, it doesn't mean that they don't have that. If you look at, for example, some of these instruments, I forgot the one that I showed today, but each string has a name. And sometimes it's, uh, well, well uh, an obvious thing for, for Central Africa. You have the multiple, pluriarch in French. So you have, you know, five strings. It's the hand. So there's the central sting, string here is, um, is the hand. And then you have chicken and the, I mean, you, each thing has a, has a name, chicken or the male, the female and things like that. So people who study that, they say, what does it mean in terms of music? Well, it means some things, but you have to understand how they are referring to that thing. And once you start to understand that thing, you have an understanding that these guys have a very clear representation of what they do. And the other things that you can do, well, <coughs> if I have one minute. <laughs> we did an experiment with a synthesizer with uh, xylophone players in Central Africa. But again, I think it's valid for East Africa. So we wanted to have an understanding of the tuning of the xylophones. So if you take a synthesizer and you stick on each of the synthesizer's key a piece of wood, and then you can retune the synthesizer. So we, we, we had everything at the same thing. We were asking the guy with earphones, now you tune the thing in the way you do the xylophone that you are playing. So he was you know, hitting each of the wooden piece that was stick. And eventually, we had the, cr the, 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 the tuning that he was doing. For us Westerners, there was an ambiguous minor, minor third that was not in the way we were looking at the minor third. It was a little bit too low, a little bit too high, but it was not correct for us. So each time that the guy was going away, we were retuning in the way we want to that. And after the third time, the guy came and he called the synthesizer crap machine because he was <laughs> mo moving the thing. So he had clearly the representation that it was necessary. And we discovered later that in the way the songs were structured, they, they were in need of having this ambiguous interval in their musical structure. So, so that, is, that is how it happens. Sorry, I've been talking too much. <laughs> <laughs>